The son of promise. That's what dad calls me. The son of promise. Well, according to dad, if all God's promises are going to come true, they will have to come true through me. No pressure growing up, right? <laughs> well, but I guess when you become a father at the age of 100, you're allowed to be a little eccentric. <laughs> Laughter. That's what mom calls me. Laughter! Well, I guess everyone calls me laughter, actually. Because, you see, my name's Isaac, and Isaac means laughter. So. <clears throat> uh, but, no, for my mom, it was more than just a name. The way she tells the story, mom named me laughter because of her joy at finally having a baby at such an advanced age. It's touching, isn't it? I mean, I get it. See, around here... Not having kids is ground for divorce. It's pretty serious. But my dad was always a little different from our neighbors. He loved mom all those years. Even though they couldn't even have kids, he still loved her. So when I finally came along, it's no wonder mom laughed. But you see, I've always heard dad tell the story too of my naming. And because I'm always the son of promise to him, uh, he told it a little differently. <clears throat> I can remember him saying, uh, Oh, your mom laughed when you were born, all right. Yeah. But I remember how she laughed the year before you were born. Laughed at an angel of God. Can you believe that? <laughs> See, Dad, he'd always pat his belly and shake his great beard when he uh, wanted to make a point for emphasis. You see, he'd say, Sarah laughed and laughed at the promise that she would give me a son from her own body. And that's when he would look to me and teach the lesson. Never laugh at the promises of God, boy. Your God can do the impossible. <laughs> you have to stick your chin out, you see, when you're imitating Dad that way. Especially when he said, your God can do the impossible. That's dad for you. So you can call me Isaac. You can call me Laughter. You can call me the son of promise. They're all related. <laughs> Though I remember a time when uh, they didn't seem related at all. Dad clung to that son of promise bit, but mom sure didn't laugh when she found out later, uh, after it was all over. You might not know, but... My dad is kind of a big deal around these parts. Although we didn't come from around here, dad was pretty well off. And he gets a lot of respect from people. So it wasn't all that crazy uh, for the old eccentric to decide we were going on a field trip. Especially if it meant a chance to worship his God. Now this was a God that our, on, our neighbors honestly didn't understand. And you know, I'm, I'm not sure Dad quite understood God all the time either. But even when he didn't understand completely, Dad just simply trusted. The Almighty God would say, field trip! And without question or hesitation, Dad just pack up a donkey. Huh. Mom would make falafel to go, of course, and uh, made sure we each took a servant along with us just in case. But moms are like that. You know. I remember being pretty excited about going on that adventure with Dad. I knew the trip was something special because uh, we had to cut wood for the sacrifice before we left. Dad didn't think we'd find kindling at a higher elevation, you see. <clears throat> so we packed firewood and our tinderbox and Headed up the mountains. And on the third day, Dad called for a halt. I, uh, I distinctly remember what he said to the servants. He said, wait here with the donkey while I go up with the boy. And uh, we're going to go up to the, a further peak in the distance. There, we will worship. And we will come back down to you. So Dad took the tinder box, and I, of course, offered to carry the wood. Dad 
picked it up off the donkey, stacked it on my back. To my surprise, it was a little bit heavier than what I was expecting. And yeah, I got a few slivers in the back on the way up. But I mean, that's just, that's life. Uh, it wasn't until we were almost there that uh, I started doing the math. Hey, Dad. That's what I asked when we stopped uh, for a small breather. I said, I see the fire. And I see the wood. But, uh, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? You, uh, you kind of missed the most important part there. Dad just stuck out that chin of his and said as if he was trying to convince himself more than me. He said, God will provide the lamb for the sacrifice, my boy. At the time, it almost sounded like a promise, but I promise he was working hard to believe himself. I'm not sure Dad Howe knew exactly where to stop, but gosh, it was a beautiful spot. You could, you could hear a spring nearby, uh, and the hill we were on looked down on this uh, young grove of uh, olives on one side, and uh, up to a timber peak where uh, was on the other side. It, uh, there was just chunks of limestone uh, just littered all over the hill, and... It only took a, a dozen or so to make a proper a proper altar. Uh, so we laid the wood carefully in kind of a bowl-like shape, you see. Uh, that was so it would cradle the offering. Dad placed the firebox right next to the limestone, and then he turned and faced me. He, he didn't threaten. He didn't beg. He didn't even try to explain. But I think he was praying under his breath as he tenderly but firmly started tying my hands and feet. Now, if Dad had panicked, I think I would have panicked too. But Dad just simply prepared my body for a sacrifice. It was all I could manage well, to, you know, keep my composure, and it was all that Dad could manage to get me up on the wood. And I caught a whiff of his old man's sweat as he laid me down on that altar. That's when he anointed me with the oil of sacrifice. It felt warm and sticky, and it just kind of ran down my forehead. Mm. That sharp smell of myrrh, in the olive oil was almost stifling. I found it suddenly hard to breathe. It's almost like I was drowning. And uh, that's when a deep terror began to, to rise up in me. I mean, can you blame me? I didn't want to die. <laughs> uh, and, and I couldn't imagine my own father ending me like this. His hopes and dreams for the future were tied up with me all on that altar. I mean, everything I thought I knew suddenly just didn't make any sense. Uh, silently, um, the ceremonial knife appeared in his hand. That's when I felt, I felt paralyzed. All I could do was watch. I wouldn't tell everyone this. This is just between you and me. But, uh, I, I can admit to you. Lying there on that wood, oil running down my head, feeling like I was going to drown, I was no longer sure there was a God of promise. <laughs> In fact, I was no longer sure there was a God at all. Finally, after all that, Dad spoke. Isaac, my son, he cried. Then he stuck out his chin again and <laughs> said, Your God can do the impossible. And he raised his knife. What I saw in his eyes in that moment took away all my doubts. 
What I saw wasn't fear in his face, or at least not only fear. Uh, I also saw love. I saw pride. Above all, I saw trust. Dad always put trust in the promise of God and in the, in the heart of our family, in the center. You know why he moved back from the strange place, right? Because God told him to. And that was it. My father didn't have a plan. He didn't have a destination in mind. God promised. God said, field trip, and Dad went. Simple as that. That dependence on God's promise is what I saw in his eyes. Even as the blade of the knife caught the sunlight and flashed, he told me later that the way he figured it, God could raise the dead if he wanted to. I mean, there I was, the son of promise, living proof that the Almighty could bring life out of dead bodies. If I died and stayed dead, then all of God's promises couldn't come true. But Dad wasn't willing to accept that, no. I was born a miracle and a promise, he said. And a God who could bring life from death was a God who could be trusted, even when it didn't make sense. <laughs> maybe his trust was contagious, you know? Or maybe it's just the way I was raised. But once I saw the trust in his eyes, I didn't even try to escape. It's not like I, it's not like I rolled off the altar and ran to the police. <laughs> I mean... The cords on my hands were pretty tight. Dad had to cut them off afterwards. But the cords on my ankles? I think Dad intentionally left them loose. And if his teenage son of promise escaped from a man who was over 100 years old, well, who could blame him? <laughs> but I didn't try to get away. No. Dad trusted God's promise. I trusted my dad. And the sacrificial knife flashed in the sunlight. Dad put his hands over my eyes, and I couldn't see what was going to happen next. It was only at that moment, at that last possible moment, did God show up. Abraham! Abraham! It was the voice of the angel of the Lord. A voice that echoes in my dreams to this day. Here I am, Dad says. Just like he always did. And God speaks. Abraham listens. It's just as simple as that. But, this time I could hear the voice too. I heard, Don't lay a hand on the boy. I have seen and now I know that you trust me above all else, since you were willing to give me your son, your son of promise. With a great sob, Dad throws down the knife and grabs me off the firewood like a younger father would have picked up his baby from a crib. And he holds me tight and tells me he loves me as tears run down that great beard of his. That embrace, he later said, was like he actually got me back from the grave. I mean, he fully intended to kill me that day. <laughs> he was just willing to do it, thinking, hoping, trusting that God could raise the dead in order to keep his promise. But for the entire trip, three long days, it seemed, well, I seemed dead to him. And now he had me back to life. So Dad, of course, was, was a mess. <laughs> well, okay, I, I admit. I was, I was pretty shaken up, too. I mean, can, can you blame me? <laughs> but as we stood there in that awkward hug, 
And it wasn't just awkward because, you know, we're crying and such. I mean, have you ever tried hugging someone with your arms tied behind your back? It just doesn't work very well. Uh, Dad looked up and saw Rem caught in a thorn bush. He was caught by his horns, you see. And that's when he says, Ah! I told you! <laughs> the Lord will provide! And that's been the name of the mountain ever since. The Lord will provide. We have a family saying that I know I'll be passing on to my kids and grandkids. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So, Dad cut me loose. We put the sacrifice on the altar. My altar. <laughs> I remember the ram fit just nicely into that dent of my, uh, that my own body made in the kindling. And as I watched the smoke rise to heaven, I couldn't help thinking that I have a God of promise. That my God provided a substitute in my place. That my God can do the impossible. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, you have to do it. You have to stick your chin out when you say that. <laughs> your God can do the impossible. Uh, I can tell you, you should have seen the look we got from the servants. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think we laughed uh, the whole way home.